then if you look at the real sequence of events, not the not not the uh, uh, mind deadening uh, repeated mantra of the U.S. government and the New York Times and blah 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 that this is an unprovoked attack that started in February 2021. Uh, which in 2022, excuse me, which is a nonsense. This isn't an unprovoked attack and it didn't start then, it started in 2014. But in 2019 onward, the U.S. poured in armaments to build up a very, very powerful army. And when Biden came in, he doubled down on this whole thing because Biden and his team, Sullivan, Blinken, Newland, have been part of this story since 2014 and really before, because Biden's always been a, an advocate of NATO enlargement. Biden's got some dark side still to be explained about Ukraine as well because of Hunter's involvement. We don't know what that is yet, but there's something not good at all about that. But I think mm -hmm. Newland has been on this case of NATO enlargement. She was actually the ambassador under Bush Jr. in 2008 to where? To NATO. In the 2008 meeting, when the U.S. pushed the proposition and forced everyone to agree that Ukraine would become a member of NATO. So Newland's been part of this story from way back when, from the Cheney Bush days. Uh, and uh, she continued through the Obama administration days as the point person for the overthrow of Yanukovych in the U.S. government and for the NATO enlargement issues. And then we started arming Ukraine heavily, especially in the late uh, 2010s. And then Biden really doubled down when he became president and repeated, uh, repeated uh, actually in several high level processes that Ukraine will become a member of NATO. And to bring us to today, and just to conclude, on December 17th, 2021, President Putin tabled a Russia-NATO security agreement in a draft based on no more NATO enlargement. And I happened to call the White House after that and said, avoid a war, negotiate. It's not even a concession. Why do we want NATO in Ukraine? It's going to provoke disaster. And I was told, oh, don't worry about it, Professor Sachs, but we'll never negotiate over NATO enlargement. It's none of Russia's business. And I said, none of Russia's business. Are you kidding? It's their border, 2,300 kilometers. How can it not be their business where the American military alliance is? But we are so arrogant that uh, we treated it as if don't have to talk to Russia about it. Then as soon as this uh, special military operation was launched in February, 2022, Zelensky said, okay, okay, I could, we could be neutral. And they actually exchanged documents, drafts and negotiated a peace arrangement a year and a half ago in March, 2022. And I talked to the negotiators, by the way, I talked to the mediators, the Turkish government in detail. And you know what happened? The United States came in and told Zelensky, no, you don't agree to neutrality. You fight on, We're, we have your back. You're gonna win, you defeat Russia. Okay, now there are hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians dead. This counteroffensive of uh, June, July, August, and September is a killing field. Ukraine doesn't have the weapons, the manpower, the training, the air cover, the artillery to do this, even if it were desirable to do, they don't have it, so they're getting smashed. And Biden doesn't have the gumption to say, you know, this was a terrible blunder, we need to agree that NATO won't enlarge and save Ukraine, but rather, oh, we're all with you for as long as it takes, meaning how many more hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians dead as long as it takes? 
oh, come on, I'm 68 years old. I know what it means as long as it takes. It means some moment the U.S. leaves. That's what it means as long as it takes. With a lot of dead in Ukraine in a country that has been absolutely pummeled by artillery nonstop, basically, on both sides since February 2024, uh, 2022, but with a lot of shooting and killing that took place since February uh, 2014. This is terrible. This is destroying Ukraine. This isn't protecting Ukraine. And so this is the real story. But again, the government lies to us. We don't get to debate it. And if you say it, you know, you're a, a, you're a Putin propagandist, you're called. But I have written an op-ed in the last couple of days that I've uh, put online where the Secretary General of NATO himself, someone I know quite well for a long time, Jens Stoltenberg, said when he was speaking in the European Parliament that Putin went to war to stop NATO enlargement. But we don't have to negotiate with him. Well, great favor to Ukraine. It's interesting. I'm just looking at this map from what you're saying. And yeah, uh, NATO has successfully, nearly successfully, completely cut Russia off from various bodies of water. I mean, you've got the Black Sea, what you're mentioning, and if they could get Georgia uh, and the rest of Ukraine, and, you know, they, then they'll have every other area around that Black Sea. The Baltic Sea yep. as well. Yep. They've, they've you got cut it. them off from the Baltic Sea. They got it with Finland. These, these are choke um, points. Yeah, right. What, what, why do you think they're trying to do that? What is the, why cut them off from the, the Black Sea or the Baltic Sea? I'm curious if the Caspian Sea is next. I mean, is yeah. that what you think they're going to go after that one as well? Look, I, I don't know if uh, you have uh, used to play Risk. You, uh, do you know that board game? Uh, yeah, it was a yeah. board game of, of my youth. Uh, the idea was to have your piece on every uh, part of the world map. Then you had taken over the world. Well, that that's uh, that's the neocon uh, vision. They're playing risk, uh, playing risk at the expense of uh, of vast numbers of deaths in many parts of the world. They want to have the U.S. military or subservient governments or supplicant governments or pliant governments everywhere on the map of the world. And uh, this is pretty relentless. Uh, and it's a, it's kind of manifest destiny writ at the global scale. It used to be at the continental scale. Nothing can stop us. We take over all of North America, uh, Native Americans notwithstanding, uh, and so forth. Uh, this is a manifest destiny at the global level. Uh, the only problem is others don't quite share this idea. and. Uh, we are getting into an awful lot of wars and they're very dangerous, very dangerous. This is a war with a nuclear superpower and obviously a very powerful military. And uh, Russia has 6,000 nuclear warheads and they're gunning after China, at least a lot of politicians in Washington. I think in the last few weeks, Biden is trying to pull back a little bit, I think from the brink, uh, but scared always of his right flank that he'll be attacked for being soft on China and so forth. But there are a lot of hardliners on China that seem really to be preparing for war. Can you imagine anything more reckless, stupid, unnecessary, potentially uh, Armageddon than that? I can't. So all of this is mind boggling to me. But the basic answer to your question is, no rational reason other than that they think they're playing global hegemon and they need their peace on every part of the map. Their consequences have already been very great, but in the short period of between two and three centuries, because Smith is writing in 1776, which has elapsed since these discoveries were made, it is impossible that the whole extent of their consequences can have been seen. And then what's wonderful about Smith in the Scottish Enlightenment is he points out that while this was generally a beneficial fact to unite the world, it was disastrous for the native inhabitants of the East and West Indies, he says, because he says that they were relatively weak at the time. He didn't understand that they also brought pathogens of the old world 
to the Americas that wiped out the population. So Smith could not have understood that, but he did understand conquest. And he said something incredibly humane at the end, which I think marks him as one of the great thinkers of modern times. He said, hereafter, perhaps, the natives of those countries may grow stronger or those of Europe may grow weaker and the inhabitants of all the different quarters of the world may arrive at that equality of courage and force which by inspiring mutual fear can alone overawe the injustice of independent nations into some sort of respect for the rights of one another. But nothing seems more likely to establish this equality of force than that mutual communication of knowledge and of all sorts of improvements which in extensive commerce from all countries to all countries naturally or rather necessarily carries along with it. So what Smith is saying is in the future there's going to come an equality because trade is going to carry knowledge, technological improvement, and an equality of force. Basically, we are 250 years after Smith's writing and that prediction has come true now. So Smith was in the middle of a 500 year period. 500 years ago, Asia in the lead in the center of gravity and in the technological lead. Europe becomes the agent of change. The steam engine, a reflection of that, not something that came out of the blue, but came out of Francis Bacon and Isaac Newton uh, and Empire. But it came out of a Glasgow workshop, uh, the condenser on James Watt's steam engine. And there came a new European and North Atlantic-led world. But as Adam Smith said, eventually trade will rebalance, and that's the convergence that we're seeing now. So Watt's steam engine, historians are right to say that what was so fundamental about the steam engine is that it broke the organic barrier of the traditional economy. Because basically, all, almost all energy of the primary energy of the pre-James Watt economy was organic. What you could feed to human beings for their labor and what you could feed to the animals for animal traction, plus a little bit of wind and a little bit of water. But basically an organic economy and we moved to a fossil fuel economy and that let loose the ability to do work of an unimaginable scale. So everything changed with the fossil fuel breakthrough in the last two and a half centuries. And of course, Europe got there first and Britain got there first of the first. And in the geopolitics, we ended up uh, with the British world. This is a map of a wonderful book, The Countries Never Invaded by Britain. Those are the ones in white. Uh, Britain went out and just beat the shit out of everybody. <laughs> and really nasty, by the way. Nasty. In 1839, showed up uh, in uh, China and saying, you have to import our opium. No, we don't want your opium. You don't want our opium, we'll beat the hell out of you. That was the first opium war. It was followed by the second opium war. No scruples at all, sorry to say. So that's power. That's the power of one-sided industrialization and it conquered much of the world. Long story and I won't go into it, but the baton was passed to uh, the younger uh, Anglo-American kid brother uh, in 1945, uh, the great Anglo-Saxon handoff and the US became the next empire. And the idea was that we would dot the world with 800 military bases around the world. And uh, Henry Luce made the sweetest love song to American leaders telling them this is the American century. That is always captivating. It was captivating to Chinggis Khan. It was captivating to Lord Palmerston. Uh, and it has been captivating to American leaders uh, since then also to believe this is your century in the world. It's over, but we still have 800 military bases around the world. Uh, I believe the Ukraine war is likely to be America's Teutoburg Forest uh, defeat. Teutoburg Forest was the uh, loss by uh, Augustus uh, Octavian in AD 9, 
when the Roman Empire tried to cross the Rhine to the east to take over Germania and was defeated. It didn't end the Roman Empire. It just told them, this is a limit, and you're not going beyond that limit. And the United States is going to learn a limit that NATO doesn't just expand at US will. There are limits to that, and that's the painful process that we're in right now. Um, but it's a secret. Don't tell anyone outside. Uh, you're likely to be canceled uh, if, if you do. Um, so the world changed fundamentally after the Second World War. The United States aspired to be the world leader, but something else happened to bring Adam Smith's forecast to reality. And that was the end of the imperial age. If there is one dimension of imperialism that I think needs to be understood, it is that imperial powers do not educate the natives. And if there's one dimension of economic development that needs to be understood, it is that education is the absolute central feature of development. Because without education, nothing else can happen. And so the European imperial powers left the world illiterate, left their colonies basically illiterate. At the end of the colonial rule, the first thing that happened was mass education. We're still not there yet, but this is the most fundamental breakthrough that happened after World War II, the end of the colonial imperial era. And the United States does its empire in a different way through regime change operations, so it's not exactly the same uh, as the occupation imperialism. But what countries got with their sovereignty was the ability to educate their people. And this has led to economic convergence. Just to show you the gaps, the peak of North Atlantic power was 1950 compared to the rest of the world. 56% of the literate world in 1950, roughly by my calculation, was in the North Atlantic region, meaning Western Europe, the United States, and Canada. Now it's 13% of the literate world. 60% of world output was in the North Atlantic region. Now it's 33% at purchasing power prices. 53% of all urban residents were in the North Atlantic world in 1950. Now it's 14%. The world's converged. Urban, literate, technologies have spread. Adam Smith was right that trade was actually the fundamental carrier of this. It was when China opened up that the acceleration of technological change came so fast to China. It was Japan that invented this process of rapid infusion of technology in the Meiji Restoration in 1868, and then again after World War II in its rebuilding. So we now see that Asia and the North Atlantic regions have crossed paths, again, using Madison's data updated by IMF data. Uh, the North Atlantic was the dominant power until uh, this gap started to close in 1950. And by around 2010, Asia is now larger than the North Atlantic region. This is the real change of the world. We know that the BRICS, even before the recent expansion to six more countries, were already larger than the G7. That's a transformed world. And China, of course, overtook the US in GDP measure to purchasing power parity around 2014. <laughs> but China is still much poorer per capita, maybe a third, but with more than four times the population. So this is the reason that China is a larger economy. So I want to argue very briefly that we're in a new age a new age, which I call the age of sustainable development. We're there in part because the scale of economic activity and a population 10 times the size of when Thomas Robert Malthus wrote The Principles of Population in 1798, which was then about 900 million people and today 8 billion people, now has put so much pressure on the physical environment that we are in urgent need of global public response to climate, biodiversity destruction, loss of ecosystem functions, and so forth. And the world adopted goals addressed to this, 
It's fitfully trying to achieve them. Today at the UN, this very day, is the midpoint review of the Sustainable Development Goals. They're way off track. Nice objectives not being achieved, mainly because the United States and other rich countries don't care at all about it. Uh, and so the world governance is not organized to achieve these goals at this point. But these goals are the real global goals and needs. So we have a very perilous moment because we have arrived at multipolarity. And as Adam Smith talked about, that balance of awe and equality of force to create justice, that's a delicate, difficult transformation. And just to say, there are several different theories of what's going on right now. Robert Kagan, uh, whom you may know is our chief uh, neocon ideologue and the uh, husband of our uh, acting uh, Deputy Secretary of State, Victoria Nuland, uh, believes uh, that American hegemony uh, must rule and will continue to rule. Otherwise, the jungle will grow back, as he says. Uh, wow. Uh, Henry Kissinger says uh, that we need a balance of power theory. Balance of power is OK, except it becomes imbalanced. Uh, and it's extremely difficult to manage. And when Bismarck was uh, thrown out by uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II, it was the end of Europe's balance of power. And World War I came in response when Bismarck's genius at balancing was lost. Uh, John Mearsheimer says we are inevitably in tragedy. That's just the nature of great power politics. Mearsheimer is extremely uh, intelligent, predictive, an extremely nice person, but, it, but tragic to read because he says that conflict is inevitable. I don't buy it. Uh, now, another theory of, uh, that I read uh, 50 years ago of a uh, wonderful uh, professor of mine also, Charles Kindleberger, uh, said we need a hegemon. So if it's not the US or Britain, it's got to be someone else like China. I don't buy that either, uh, but this is a brilliant book. Boy, it led to a lot of late night discussions uh, over the next 50 years. Um, Graham Allison says, uh, as with Sparta and Athens, uh, we're prone for war, not inevitable, but uh, the war trigger is very high because of the rise of China. And my little contribution is, could we get our heads together and address global public goods and avoid global public bad? So I argue that we need a rational approach, not a tragic approach, and that it is not beyond us to reach the cooperative corner of the prisoner's dilemma. Uh, in other words, we can understand the game. We can understand the risks of defection. But we can understand the benefits of cooperation. And so we should be able to reach that cooperative outcome. So I would argue that we need a new geopolitics and a new ethics of sustainable development. I often refer to President Kennedy's inaugural address when he said, the world is very different now. For man holds in his mortal hands the power to abolish all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. So what hangs in the balance is something extraordinary. We could achieve SDG 1 and poverty, or we could blow up the world. And what is absolutely incredible is how this is in the hands of a very few people. That's what's incredible. And by the way, my takeaway from Oppenheimer was what a bunch of geniuses that invented the bomb and what a bunch of dolts who use it or decide about using it. This is our paradox. It took the greatest geniuses of the age to understand nuclear fission and how this uh, could be created. And then it fell into the hands of uh, the everyday uh, person who might not have the imagination to keep us away from global disaster. That's technology, by the way. Technology is often created by geniuses and used by all of us. Uh, and uh, that is the real issue that uh, Plato was wondering about already in the Republic uh, 2,350 years ago. How do you make the rulers uh, 
know what to do. He said you have to raise them from birth for that purpose. So there are crucial public goods at regional and global scale. This is something new. Regional scale, like the European Union or ASEAN or African Union, this is something new how important this scale is. And global scale is almost unprecedented in human history. We had global trade, we had interconnectedness, but global public goods, not so much. Now we are with the center of global public goods, but institutions in the hands of nation states. Why? Weird. So I believe we need new kinds of global governance and ethics, and uh, I think the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a good place to start. We're in the uh, 75th anniversary this year, and I believe that we can even find a common wisdom, which I call the ABCs uh, of ancient wisdom, Aristotle, Buddha, and Confucius. They all, by the way, were virtue ethicists. They basically said, cultivate your soul as decent people. It said it in somewhat different ways, but they said it's virtue that gives us the capacity to reach the cooperative solution, whether it's civic virtue, friendship virtue, or the other virtues of sociality. And Aristotle said it's possible because we are zoon politikon. We are political animals. We can be sociable. And so I think finding this commonality of East and West is crucial now because there actually is a strong commonality of the underlying cultures. This was already pointed out in the uh, observations of uh, the axial age uh, uh, that these philosophies uh, arose roughly the same time and with uh, roughly the same uh, philosophical underpinnings. And I'll just end with uh, President Kennedy's remarks 60 years ago. We're at the 60th anniversary of Kennedy's remarkable initiative to make peace at the height of the Cold War and to no negotiate the partial nuclear test ban treaty, which was ratified just these days 60 years ago. Kennedy may well have been killed for it because rogue elements of the U.S. government hated him for his peace initiatives, and uh, I believe that this is probably what uh, did him in. Uh, but he made uh, wonderful observations about peace, and uh, I'll just end with his uh, most beautiful words. So let us not be blind to our differences, but let us also direct attention to our common interests and to the means by which those differences can be resolved. And if we cannot end now our differences, at least we can help make the world safe for diversity. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet, we all breathe the same air, we all cherish our children's future, and we are all mortal. Thank you very much. I think it really strengthens <coughs> of carbon peaking by 2030 and uh, carbon neutralization by 2050. But I feel like the United States haven't done enough of you know promoting this ideology of you know carbon neutrality. So how, as citizens, ourselves can you know push for those changes it's interesting in the united states most people know that climate change is a very serious crisis and we just had the devastating fires in hawaii yeah. to show how tragic this climate change is we're in the hottest period in not only recorded uh history, but in human history for the last 125,000 years, the month of July was probably the single hottest month ever uh, that humanity has experienced. And certainly that's true during the period of recorded temperatures. So we should be doing much more. And the American people know this. And certain things are happening, of course. There's investment in green energy in a lot of places. There's investment in the conversion of the auto industry to electric vehicles, which is part of the solution. But at, And at the national level, there was a piece of legislation, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, which is was a very strange name, 
for legislation which is mainly centered on the energy transformation and it gives tax breaks for green energy but it, what it doesn't do is make a national plan there right. is no national plan it, right. it doesn't make a national plan because in american politics uh, the power of the fossil fuel lobby big oil and big coal is so strong that politicians don't tell the truth to their own constituents and they act on behalf of their lobbies who pay for their campaigns rather than on behalf of the American people. In the United States Senate, in the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, uh, the chairman, Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia, is notorious for being the front for the big oil lobby. And he himself has family wealth tied up in two coal companies. So right. I regard that as corruption, but in the American system, it's legal corruption or seems to be legal, but it's corruption not nonetheless. Uh, if you're told that in a country uh, that hasn't taken a clear plan for decarbonization has senior officials who own coal companies, you'd say, well, of course, that's just political corruption. But unfortunately, that's how the United States works. So the American people are saying more and more, we're disgusted with the political system. It's all about money. It's all about the reelection uh, of these corrupt politicians. And right. I think that the more we clarify how broken this is, the farther we're going to get. But of course, at substantive levels, we need a plan of action to decarbonize by 2050 that is not only at the state level, because many states have such plans taking shape, but at the federal level. Uh, and one of the main lessons of what's happening right now is that there are more projects in oil, I'm sorry, more projects in wind and solar Yep. then can be put onto the grid because the real breakdown is the transmission system. But that's where federal investment and a federal plan is needed. And we don't have that because of all the political problems that I talked about. And I think that America's structure is <coughs> so like money based, money focused, that it comes before the mutual benefits the mutual benefits that all the human can get it's that's always exactly right yeah it's, it's always it, yeah it's not based on the common good it's based based on the special interest right it's always money 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 and then i want to touch on this is that we all know that J japanese is going to have a nuclear wastewater dumps so what are some actions that united nations would do to counter this type of behavior well on on the specifics on japan i can't really uh, comment because I haven't studied the scientific arguments on both sides and in general on technical arguments I tend to listen to the range of experts and ask their opinion so I would think at a minimum what the UN should be doing and maybe it is and I'm just not uh, in involved at all in it is uh, looking at through the international atomic energy agency which is based in vienna at this question of the wastewater from fukushima and what should be done about it because that's a technical issue that should not be any individual government's authority the un should weigh in especially at the technical level but in general we have some pretty clear needs that are urgent whether it's the decarbonization or protecting the ecosystems from pollution or from over harvesting or from waste. And we need technical plans of action. But that planning mechanism is hard work. Uh, and it's hard work for the political reason of keeping it free from corruption. And it's hard work at the technical level because a lot of technical issues are raised. And so countries need effective planning ministries. China has the National Development and Reform Commission, NDRC, which does a lot of the technical planning. And the United States doesn't have a planning uh, right. ministry. 
So we, we don't make plans uh, because we don't have a, a ministry of planning or a ministry of economy or a planning agency. In the US lexicon, planning is a bad idea. But <laughs> you know, for certain things, uh, I am happy that planning is done within private businesses. But for other things, I want the planning to be done by government. And in every sphere of the economy, planning is essential. It's just that sometimes it's not a government function. Sometimes it's a private sector function. Yeah. And like, like you mentioned, the United States government needs to go through a really big structural change. And in that, I think the driving forces are the Gen Z and Gen Alpha uh, people coming up. But right now, I think we like we lack guidance. So what are some advices that you would guide, uh, like some advices that you would give us to start with? Well, that's a really uh, very interesting and deep question, because uh, let me just say that our Constitution was drafted in 1787. Of course, it's had some amendments since then, but basically it's the same structure that was decided in 1787. And it's out of date. Uh, it doesn't have the substantive principles that are needed for the modern period, and it does not uh, enable uh, the strong planning or environmental protection or assurance of economic rights for the people. So it's really an out of date structure in many, many ways. It, at the same time, it has been uh, deeply damaged by uh, corruption, uh, by the money in the politics. So I would make many changes, but I think uh, the idea should be that sustainable development, that means e an economy that works for the common good and that protects the environment and that uh, provides the public services that anyone needs, whether it's health or education, uh, that uh, these are part of the citizens' rights and responsibilities, and that the government has the effective means to carry that out uh, without the corruption of uh, private money in politics is, is central. And I think, uh, as you say, today's young people are going to really need to fix the U.S. system because yeah. otherwise it's just going to continue to be in decline. And yeah, I think currently the problem, another problem with the U.S. is that it's basically red scare volume two. Like any, like the counter uh, propaganda against China is like, oh, China is bad to all the young people. So that creates a really unhealthy into their mindset about a prejudice about China and unwilling to learn about these different type of political systems that might have some policies that could be used in the United States. So yeah, excellent point. Basically, there are a lot of lies about a lot of things in, right. uh, in politics in the United States. Because if you have a system that's based on special interests, the special interests try to hide. Uh, they want their benefits without uh, saying, you see, I run the government. Uh, so we have a, a, a set of falsehoods uh, that keep uh, clarity uh, at a distance, actually. Yeah. Uh, and so it takes some effort. But as you say, the anti-China propaganda is is really heavy uh, and uh, very intense right now by people who know nothing about China or its history uh, or its economic successes in the last 40 years or the hard work of the people. Right. And how do we counter those mis misinformation? I, I think uh, we have uh, first uh, any any uh, lies need to be called out. So I try to do that uh, on a daily basis uh, and uh, through articles and books and speeches. But I think it's also important that young people make direct contacts uh, and use the digital connections across schools. So University of Michigan and Tsinghua University yep. uh, working together, discussing uh, and so forth, somehow making such projects, uh, both the economic, cultural, business, technological, I think would be a big help. Uh, but our government is really aiming to, uh, as you say, scare people 
rather right. than to really educate them. Yeah, and the penultimate question is, where do you see the economy, the world economy in sustainable development ways to achieve in five to 10 years? The, the good sign is that we have so much new good technology, 5G, uh, low cost renewable energy, um, robotics, uh, many uh, new approaches to problem solving. Uh, we really could make the energy transformation to safe energy at low cost. And this is the most important point, use our knowledge uh, and deploy it at scale. But uh, the challenge is uh, conflict, division, vested interests, uh, greed uh, that impedes us from using these solutions at scale. So it's, it's not even possible to predict the future with any insight because we could have a good future with big solutions, or we could have a very broken, divided, dangerous future, and we have to fight for the good one. And, and that's why this is more of a question of effort than prediction. Yeah. So last of all, so what is one message that you will want to share with all the young viewers that are aspiring to be you know, great econ uh, economists and entrepreneurs? Well, go be the best you can, but serve the common good as you do it. Uh, don't lose sight of the fact that we are in an interconnected world. We need global problem solving. We need friendships across nations. All this talk of war and conflict and division is extremely dangerous and completely unnecessary. And so go be champions of sustainable development, use new technologies, be great entrepreneurs, but always do it in a peaceful and cooperative mindset, not doing it because we have to beat the other side, but because it's good for the world. Put one and one together to say, well, if Russia's in control of the plant, maybe they're not shelling their own plant. Maybe it's Ukraine shelling the plant. Well, I can tell you, I speak to a lot of people. <laughs> it's almost surely Ukraine shelling the power plant. And we can't bring ourselves to express a simple truth. And that hurts because they continue to shell the power plant with impunity. And we should say, stop shelling the power plant. Yes, it would be good if, if uh, you had control of the power plant, we can say to them, but don't shell a nuclear power plant. But we can't even find those words. That's the problem, because we're kind of faking the whole thing as if this isn't a US-Russia thing. Then we say, OK, do it. Go defeat Putin. That's great. That's what we want. Defeat the guy with 1,600 active nuclear warheads and several thousand more in reserve. Go ahead, go do it. As if this isn't our Armageddon that we're heading to. And that's really been a massive failure of this administration till now. One thing I've learned in, uh, I'm 67 years old, I've been through a lot of US wars, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Nicaragua, Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, Libya, Yemen, and more. It's the job of the President of the United States to put on the brakes because this country is a war machine at the top. We don't see it. We don't know it exactly. Eisenhower told us about it with the military industrial complex. This country is a war machine. The main job of the president of the United States is to stop the war machine from making wars. And we are now in an escalation heading towards Armageddon, according to the president. That's not a spectator sport. That's his job to keep us away from Armageddon. And, and Professor Sachs, you said this is a war between the US and Russia. We've heard threat after threat or call after call for an end 
to the Nord Stream 2 pipeline from Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Nuland to Joe Biden himself. Senator Ron Johnson, in questioning Nuland, appeared to actually call for the sabotage of the pipeline. But I'm, I'm literally talking about rolling back the, the, the pipeline. And I, I loosely define that, but I mean, taking action that will prevent it from ever becoming operational. And so who do you think is responsible for the worst act of industrial sabotage in recent memory and maybe in, in long memory? And what would their motive be considering that the German economy was on the hook here? <laughs> you know, I've said I, I, I wasn't there, but uh, my guess is <laughs> just like I think Ukraine is shelling the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant, I think the United States blew up Nord Stream. And they told us, you know, Biden said it in February said if Putin invades, Nord Stream is over. And then a reporter said, well, what do you mean, Mr. President? How are you going to do that? He said, we have, we have our ways. We have our ways. We, we will bring an end to it. But, the, but how, will you, how will you do that exactly, since the project and control of the project is within Germany's control? We will, uh, I promise you, we'll be able to do it. Come on, uh, who controls the airspace, who monitors the airspace, who has the means to do this, who said we're going to do it, who said afterwards, this is a tremendous opportunity, this new situation, a tremendous opportunity to permanently wean Europe from Russian gas. That would be Secretary of State Blinken. Who said, thank you, USA, tweeting a picture of the burst pipeline, that would be Radek Sikorsky, former foreign minister of Poland. I, and by the way, you know, I've, uh, <laughs> I've been in touch with reporters uh, in papers that say, we don't know, or even worse, who say Russia did this. And then I talk to very senior reporters and they say, Jeff, of course, it's, it's the US, what do you think? But it doesn't get into our news. My guess is, my guess is that we're going to hear from Europe's investigators in a week or so. Hmm, very hard. We don't know. Trail went cold. Very hard to tell. We'll keep looking, but uh, we don't know. But uh, terrible blow, terrible blow. That would be consistent with the U.S. doing it. And the fact that things went a bit quiet after this, rather than parliamentarians throughout Europe demanding our core infrastructure was blown up tells me that they're told keep it quiet keep it quiet we don't really want to know exactly what happened so i can't prove this but it sure does to my mind put all the suspicion on the u.s side warnings motive capability subsequent behavior strange statements to my mind, it adds up. I don't think Russia would blow up its core infrastructure. That doesn't make sense. And anyone else that did it would, you know, with Poland or Denmark or anyone else, that would be NATO. That would be with the U.S. President Joe Biden has said, Professor Sachs, that there will be an investigation into what he has deemed an act of deliberate sabotage. He said he'll send divers down, which is interesting because he knows that divers can reach it. Um, but do, do you think that this investigation will be a whitewash like the kind we saw the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons carry out where inspectors were actually censored and even attacked by OPCW leadership around the Duma Syria uh, chemical weapon attack allegations in April 2018. And what do you what do you make specifically of that allegation? Um, my colleague here, Aaron Mate, has done as much to expose the cover up as anyone. So it's a real issue of interest here. Well, on uh, this, uh, you know, the pipeline, the U.S. can't be the one investigating if the U.S. is uh, the most likely culprit. I mean, they, they can, but we're not going to uh, find uh, any credibility in, in what comes out of this. Uh, so I think the idea of uh, an independent and transparent investigation would, would be great, but I'm not holding my breath. Uh, so uh, the U.S. may say something. Again, I'm 67 years old. It 
took me a long time to grow up to know that almost everything we hear is not true. We are a security state. We have a secret state, which uh, runs uh, most of our foreign and military policy, of course, and we don't hear the real thing. So I'm not putting too much stock uh, in, uh, in what the U.S. comes up with. I'm a little more curious about what the Europeans say. It's their infrastructure, after all. Uh, it's their economy. It's their uh, gas pipeline. And you would think that they might be interested in actually knowing. But what's also true is that if they do find out or they do know, which I presume they do, uh, they're not speaking also because, you know, the U.S. they think is their security umbrella. I think the U.S. is uh, the great provocation that threatens Europe uh, just about as much as anything right now. So I don't know if we'll ever find out the truth, but frankly, there are so many issues that we never find out the truth about because we never really look. And when you have a state based on secrecy and impunity and like in love story never having to say you're sorry the cia doesn't say oh we made a mistake so sorry let's have a careful review of what we've done we're not going to find out about syria we're not going to find out about uh, this not from the u.s at least on on syria and the chemical weapons i'm I listen to you guys. I'm not enough of an expert or inside to know. But what I do know as a very basic, very basic point, the U.S., of course, uh, really instigated the war in Syria in 2011. It was the plan, like a hundred times before, to overthrow Assad. President uh, Obama signed a a, a presidential finding to task the CIA to work with Saudi Arabia and others to overthrow Assad. This was Operation Timber Sycamore. What is amazing to me about the whole thing is that there's almost not been any coverage, review, explanation of this. We heard only this is a civil war. That's what we heard again and again. And then we hear even more extraordinarily, Putin intervened in Syria. Look what the Russians have done. Putin intervened years after the U.S. took action to overthrow Russia's ally. But we can't get this story told. I think the New York Times covered Operation Sycamore one day, if I remember, something around 2016. Nothing beforehand, nothing after. And I, I knew a lot about this in those years at the time uh, because I, I knew what was happening through uh, diplomatic channels and so forth. It was like reality here, weirdness of our mainstream media here, and a narrative that was completely devoid of facts for years. And newspapers, that are, of course, absolutely counter-informative. Quick uh, question on Ukraine before we move on to other topics. What do you think guides the U.S. officials who are overseeing the current policy? I mean, we had someone like Lindsey Graham recently say that as long as the U.S. arms Ukraine, they will fight to the last person. Four months into this thing, I like the structural path we're on here. As long as we help Ukraine with the weapons they need and the economic support, they will fight to the last person. Do you think that's the prevailing mentality right now? And, and why are they so determined to sacrifice Ukraine in this war against Russia? And, and if I could piggyback on that question, Professor Sachs, since you mentioned the, the Cuban Missile Crisis and your understanding of it, uh, throughout the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Kennedy brothers, John F. Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, were pushing back against the Joint Chiefs. Then later in Vietnam, although LBJ was going along with the Joint Chiefs, he was listening to character figures like George Ball, Assistant Secretary of State, who was an opponent of the war. Uh, do you have any insight into the thinking of the Biden administration? And is there anyone there who is resisting this drive towards nuclear escalation? I think that the uh, core motivation of the U.S. goes back to the neocon uh, 
approach to foreign policy, which basically uh, has been the approach of the United States for 30 years now. At the end of the Soviet Union, the neocons took power, they're still in power, and their view is the U.S. is the unipolar power, it's the sole superpower, and we're going to keep it that way. And under U.S. strategic doctrines right now, there are two threats. Uh, Russia is one and China is the other. And it's not an accident that we're in confrontations on two fronts right now. So when it comes to Russia, as Big Brzezinski pretty much spelled this out in his uh, very interesting book, uh, uh, The Global Chessboard, uh, Grand Chessboard, A Global Chessboard, 1997, uh, where he said that uh, Ukraine is the geographical pivot of Eurasia. It's the key. Uh, if the United States is basically uh, in charge, uh, Russia ceases to be even a regional power, basically. It's uh, cut out from the Black Sea and the Eastern Mediterranean. Ukraine's a big prize if you're a neocon. Uh, if, you know, and a neocon is someone who views the world like the game of risk that you want to get all your pieces on the board and you want to take uh, all of your opponent's pieces off the board. And Ukraine is really strategic from their point of view. And this has been spelled out by Robert Kagan, for example. He's, they've written about this quite openly. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, th that family is, has been part of this for the whole time because uh, Victoria Newland is the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs in the United States right now. She's been through this, through all these administrations. And so I think that this is the core, that we're going to expand NATO. They have the idea that the North Atlantic reaches to Georgia. Now, that's an interesting idea. That was uh, George Bush's uh, geographical insight in 2008. Extraordinarily cynical. But if you look at a map, what's the game plan? The game plan is control the Black Sea. It is Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, and Georgia all surrounding Russia, where their naval fleet is. So that's what Brzezinski was outlining back in 1997. Now, they thought they could kind of slip it in uh, without uh, you know, Russia being able to oppose it because they kept expanding NATO uh, step by step. First, the three, uh, Hungary, Poland, Czech Republic, by the way, against the promise, the clear, unequivocal promise to Gorbachev that NATO would not expand to the East. And like so many other things, the US government said, oh, we never said that. Well, they're liars. Of course they said it. And there's a full documentary record, easily accessible on the web to understand what was said. So long and the short of it is that's been the game plan for 30 years. And it's had its ups and downs because there, Ukraine itself is internally divided between East and West. And so the presidents have gone back and forth, pro-Russia, anti-Russia. And when a pro-Russian president, Viktor Yanukovych, came in in 2010, after Bush had invited Ukraine into NATO, over the opposition, by the way, of European leaders, but this is a US-led alliance, Yanukovych guided neutrality through the Ukrainian parliament. That stabilized things for a little while until Yanukovych was overthrown. Overthrown by whom? Well, according to the US narrative, oh, the mass, masses on the streets. According to what I saw with my own eyes, we stirred a lot of the pot and paid for a lot of that overthrow. I don't know how much. Everything's a lie. Everything's hidden. But the Russians say that was a coup that the US led. I can't tell you exactly the US role, but we, we heard Victoria Newland on the tape uh, describing the formation of the new government and uh, other choice words for our European allies. And uh, I know with my own eyes, by the way, about US involvement uh, in, in that, not my involvement. I saw it. I was, oh my God, that's pretty weird what's going down. And this is Russia's point, which is, okay, you broke it again. Now, because as soon as that, as Yanukovych went down, the new government said, we want NATO. And then the US started pouring in the weapons, billions of dollars 
during the Trump years. Then Biden came and I thought, my God, maybe we'll get some sanity. Of course, he doubled down three times in 2021. At the highest levels, we said Ukraine will be a member of NATO in the NATO annual meeting, in a State Department strategic document with Ukraine, and in a Defense Department strategic document. So we doubled down. That's when I called the White House at the end of the year, please take the off ramp. But they don't want to take the off ramp. Now we're close to Armageddon, we're told. There is an off ramp. We better take the off ramp. We better start talking rather than just escalating. Then John Mearsheimer's right. It's all a tragedy because not everybody can be dominant. And if that's your view, I suggest you go first to a psychologist, <laughs> a psychiatrist, uh, or a good counselor, or a good friend who could help calm you down and tell you about the good things in life, but not the importance of being dominant because that really does create a problem if that were generalized. You could think about it in a Kantian way. That does not work uh, as a categorical imperative if everybody is aiming for dominance. So, but in this essay of Blackwell, we, our grand strategy is to be dominant. And so he writes very clearly, China's rise is no longer in America's interest. Uh-huh. That's pretty weird. Now, we should understand a couple of basic things. China is roughly the same size as the US economy right now in aggregate. Depends how you measure things. There are always two ways to measure things. One is at the prices of each country's own markets, and then you convert the yuan uh, output to dollar output with the market exchange rate, and that's called market prices. And the other is a common set of prices that you apply to the goods and services of each country. That's called purchasing power parity adjusted prices. And by the market prices, China's economy in the aggregate is something like three quarters of the size of the US in dollar terms. China's four times larger. So that would mean three quarters times one quarter or three sixteenths the size or roughly uh, in per capita terms 20% of the US uh, um, economy in total size three quarters. If you look at it at international prices or purchasing power adjusted prices, China's a bigger economy. And the IMF gives us data all the time in what is called the World Economic Outlook. You can go to imf.org and just look at the data, which I do 10 times a day for my job. Uh, and if you look at the purchasing power adjusted prices, China is about 30% larger than the United States in absolute size. So 1.3 divided by 4, because the population is four times larger. So in per person terms, about 30% or 35% of the US. China's poorer per capita than the United States, but it's a big economy because 1.4 billion people is a lot more than 335 million people, which is the US population. Now, that's freaking out the policymakers in the US. They're bigger. How dare they be bigger? But it's kind of arithmetic. The only way that China could be smaller than the US is to stay at a per capita income less than a fourth of America. But why should they? <clears throat> because China's filled with clever people, with good entrepreneurs, with technology. Technology flows in this world. It always has, and it will continue to. And China now is absolutely in the front ranks of scientific breakthroughs and of technological innovation, arguably ahead in many, many sectors 
uh, comparable in many and behind in some, but a superpower in science and technology and with superb universities and all of the things that make for a high income country. And why not? China was the world leader for 1,000 years at least. Uh, it uh, lost that lead by a terrible policy era, error in the year 1434 uh, when uh, the Ming court stopped the great fleet of uh, Admiral Zheng He and uh, China went uh, protectionist and uh, the next time uh, it uh, was really deeply exposed to the world is when uh, British steamers were uh, coming up the river to uh, bomb the uh, uh, to, to bomb the Qing uh, uh, imperial properties uh, in, uh, in uh, the uh, First Opium War. So China is going to be successful and it's not going to stay at less than a quarter of U.S. per capita income. It's going to continue to grow. And incidentally, you read these days op-eds, oh, China's miracle's over. Uh, China's finished, the Chinese economy is collapsing. This is so ignorant, I can't even tell you. Uh, China, by the way, ha will have business cycles like the United States does. It will have uh, financial booms and busts. Uh, nobody has figured out how to avoid financial crises in the last 300 years of market economy, so China no doubt has uh, too much debt in some uh, cities uh, and in uh, some real estate enterprises, no doubt. But China's going to continue to grow and it's going to continue to narrow the gap with the United States in per capita terms. It's going to be bigger than the United States uh, in absolute terms. It already is by one good measure and it will be by the other good measure without doubt unless there's global calamity of some sort, which uh, I'm putting aside for the moment. And so the whole idea of American grand strategy is really messed up. And that is one large part of our problem right now. What Blackwell and Tellus recommended in this essay in 2015 or 2016, um, and when you read something on the Council on Foreign Relations, usually what's written is already policy, so it's letting the public know what the thinking in Washington is. It's not really even a trial balloon. It's already what's established. Blackwell says that China's rise is no longer in America's interest, and then there's a list of things that should be done. We should use trade policy to stop uh, China's export growth. We should restrict the flow of technology to China. We should bolster our military alliances uh, along the Pacific Rim countries. We should form trade groups uh, in Asia that don't include China. One of the weirdest ideas imaginable, by the way, if they would ever look at a map, they would see that this is not really the most sensible idea in the world. But grown-ups in Washington, they're not they're physically grown-ups. Uh, they actually did this. Uh, this was the whole idea of the TPP. Stupider, I can't imagine. But we have grown-ups that say, let's have a trade agreement in Asia where China's the lead trade partner of every one of the countries, and clever us, we won't include China. Okay, this is what passes for public policy. So. Blackwell listed all the things that we should do. And we're doing all of them. First, in the instability of the Trump period, where there's a lot of noise to signal, so you never knew day to day what was really going on, nor did anyone else, including the president. But he started this process of unilateral trade measures and barking at China and uh, generally trying to uh, raise tensions. And then Biden came in, and I thought there would be some uh, more grown-up behavior uh, 
as I said, and actually it got worse uh, because it became more systematic, more systematically wrong. So what Biden did is just going through the list of, that Black will set out in 2016 uh, or 2015, which is all the measures one takes of containment. And this is, one should understand, this is the third round of American policy in this regard. It was invented for the Soviet Union, and it was deployed in the 1950s vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union. And then, interestingly, it was deployed in a lighter way against Japan at the end of the 1970s, at the end of uh, the 1980s and early 1990s, because Japan became so successful that even though Japan was our ally and has no army and everything else, Japan basically became an enemy uh, in, in uh, economic terms, and the United States landed very heavily on Japan and said, you can't export anymore to us, and you have to agree to that, you have to overvalue your currency by 50%, and you have to do all sorts of things because we're not going to let you uh, continue to have the success. And we stopped Japanese growth. So this is the third try of this. But China's not Japan. Uh, Japan is uh, 125 million people, and China's 1.4 billion people, and Japan is under the US security umbrella, and China is an independent superpower, and it's not going to sit still uh, the way that Japan did in the early 1990s. China's going to figure out its way around all of this. But that was a big part of what we're seeing right now. So in a deep sense, Mearsheimer was right. China did nothing special to provoke any of this other than achieving rapid economic growth and economic progress. I see nothing extraordinary, of course. Every claim of China's success is they stole it from us, they, they cheated. This is uh, both fantasy and prejudice mixed together with the fact that everybody steals a bit from everybody else, so there was nothing special about uh, what China did. But in any event, it is the playbook contained China and that's a big part of what's going on. There's one other part of what's happening in our relationship, which is more economic, but also playing a role. And that is that when China achieved its economic success, heavily based on export-led growth, and heavily based on export-led growth to the US market, just as Adam Smith said, this made the U.S. richer, it made China richer, it was a win-win proposition, uh, the strong uh, interrelations of China and the United States. But what you learn from trade history and trade theory both is that a win-win proposition at the aggregate level that the U.S. became a richer economy because China was becoming a richer economy also went alongside inequalities within the United States, some of which arose from trade itself. So in international trade, there are losers as well as winners. The most basic theorem of international trade, going back to Smith and David Ricardo and Paul Samuelson in the 20th century, is that the winners win more than the losers lose, so that the overall size of the economy grows. And for everybody to win from trade, the winners should compensate the losers. So the idea is a growing economy, which the US has had, should be enough for everybody to rise in that economy, but instead, there are pockets in our, not just pockets in our society, but significant parts of our society that are not rising, they're falling. So the U.S. has become very rich, and the rich part of the United States has become really rich. And there are two parts of our society that are hurting. 
One is specifically places that are in the import competition with China, and that is the Midwest to an important extent. And those happen to be swing states in presidential elections. So Wisconsin, Minnesota, <coughs> Ohio, my home state of Michigan, Indiana, Pennsylvania, and so forth. A lot of places there were hit by very uh, high quality, low cost Chinese manufactured exports. And the second part of our society that's been hit in general is people with educational attainment of high school or less, because our society's absolutely diverged between university education and high school education on every dimension of well-being, including life expectancy, including health, including income levels, and so on. Now, in international trade theory and practice, the winners should help the losers. But we're a kind of nasty society. I think I would like to make that clear. Uh, our political system was invented in the British mode of John Locke. John Locke, the philosopher at the end of the 17th century. And John Locke's idea was that you own your own labor, and nobody should take it away from you. And that is pretty deeply embedded in the American psyche, which is, that's mine, thank you. And I don't want to be taxed. And we are a low tax society that complains endlessly about taxes. That's the American tradition, in fact, there would be no United States of America other than for a tax revolt. The British wanted to put a little bit of tax on the Americans to help pay for the post-1763 uh, costs uh, after the Seven Years' War, and the colonists said, hell no, we don't have to pay any taxes, and no taxes uh, without representation, and by the way, no taxes with representation <laughs> is the American way as well because our Congress is bought off by rich people who tell them, don't you dare ever pay, charge us more taxes. That's how the American political system works. So, simply, the winners don't like to compensate the losers in the United States. In fact, they like to say, you're losers. And so, Trump ran on this basis, instead of running on what a nice party in Europe would run on a social democratic platform that says, you know, we're all one society and we're awfully rich and we should make sure that even if you lose your job, you have health care uh, and uh, college education is too expensive, so we'll make sure that it's affordable. That's what a nice place would do. What Trump ran on was something completely different. He ran on tax cuts for the rich and China is the one causing you all this. <laughs> you see? Thank you, Donald. Uh, China is the one causing you all this pain. They stole your jobs. And I'm never going to let them get away with that. And so intersecting with our grand strategy, which is uh, ridiculous, is the protectionism that comes from a society in which winners don't compensate losers, but winners deflect the blame by blaming foreigners. And Trump's whole campaign was, you can blame everyone else except rich people. Rich people we give tax cuts to, but blame the uh, the people coming up from the border from Mexico, or blame the Chinese, or blame the foreigners. That plays well. Uh, it makes a nasty society even nastier and more disorganized and disoriented, and he did a very good job of that. And the Democrats, what used to be my party before I decisively left it, uh, I have no home politically. Uh, I'm just disgusted by all of it. 
Um, the Democrats learned the lesson of 2016, which is, oh, protectionism is the way to win power. So the Democrats are always learning from the Republicans. They learned from the Republicans in the 1980s, always advocate for tax cuts. That's how Reagan became so popular. And then the Democrats, and remember, well, you don't remember, but if you're as old as I am, you remember Walter Bondale said, he's going to raise taxes. I'm going to raise taxes. He's going to raise taxes, too. He just won't tell you. And Mondale lost 49 states uh, by saying that. And since then, no Democrat has said, we'll raise taxes. They just follow the Republicans. Then it used to be that the Republicans were free traders. And then Trump cleverly uh, exploited uh, the widening inequalities in the United States and turned it into an anti-China protectionism. And then the Democrats have learned that, too. So, and then we have our grand strategist of our day, Jake Sullivan, uh, who uh, put the two pieces together and said, we can be protectionist and uh, use this to contain China and win elections. And he's made a huge mess of everything uh, by basically advising and helping to guide a policy where Biden came in and decided to double down on the anti-China sentiment and the anti-China policies. So in the first year of the administration, where I had a lot of former friends, they're not my friends anymore, I mean, I like them still, they don't like me anymore. Um, but anyway, I said, oh, now reach out to your counterparts. We know all the technocrats in China, all the economic technocrats, of course, because we trained a lot of them. They're our students. Uh, they're our friends for 30 years or 40 years. They said, no, 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 the White House has said no contact. You can't have contact. We're reviewing our China policy. So for the first year, there was no discussion, basically, even at the technocratic level. It was amazing. So wrong-headed, by the way. As an academic, I could keep all the contacts, talk to people, <coughs> see friends, visit Beijing before COVID uh, hit, um, and uh, at least keep open channels. But the administration, no open channels at all. And then the idea was, the tension must be good for our politics. We'll show how tough we are. We'll continue containment. We'll uh, be more protectionist. We'll have a build in America policy, which is what uh, Trump is, uh, not Trump, what uh, Biden is trying to do with the Infrastructure Act and the Inflation Reduction Act and so forth. And that is how things went basically until about six months ago. I would add in Nancy Pelosi's absolutely absurd and reckless trip to Taipei. You just can't imagine more irresponsibility than that, in my opinion. And she is enormously irresponsible. Uh, and uh, just playing for the home crowd. But she went, and so Taiwan is added to this, and President Tsai uh, in Taiwan has also been, in my opinion, irresponsible by uh, rhetoric that is very loose, very dangerous, and in the midst of all of these other tensions, uh, just uh, raising the stakes in a way that allow our worst hotheads, and if you want our very worst hothead, it's Lindsey Graham, uh, dumber you cannot get, uh, and uh, more militaristic you cannot get. He wants war everywhere. This week it's with Iran, but uh, before that it was with China, before that it was with uh, Russia. Uh, so this is really our state of affairs, that the protectionism, the grand strategy, the uh, irresponsibility of uh, Washington politicians, 
I think, created all of this. I can't see. China made one, one mistake, by the way, uh, rhetorically. And that was in 2014 when China launched the Made in China 2025 policy, which is a very smart policy calling for China to become leader in technology in 10 major areas. China said not that we want to advance in these areas. China said we want to dominate in these areas. <laughs> we want to lead in these areas. That was not a good idea. It would have been much smarter to say we want to advance in these areas. We could have saved a lot of grief by uh, a different uh, kind of uh, rhetoric. So this is my basic interpretation of where we are right now. I said that it came to about six months ago when things were really boiling. I mean, very dangerous. The balloon incident, the war in Ukraine going not the way that the United States wanted or expected, another debacle of US foreign policy, terrible debacle, because that's a war that never should have happened, and it was a war caused by this relentless idea of NATO enlargement to Ukraine, which is, <laughs> talk about red lines, it's like Taiwan, but from Russia's point of view. Uh, you don't put the US military on the Ukraine-Russia border, and they couldn't figure that out because they're not very clever at thinking through the eyes of the other side. So six months ago, things were really getting out of hand, and here we are. I think they decided about six months ago this is getting, this, this is not good. Uh, we need to start dialing back. And so that's why several uh, of our cabinet uh, 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 secretaries went uh, to China, uh, why the rhetoric was toned down. Still, they can't quite calibrate this because even when, say, Janet Yellen went, uh, <coughs> and she was uh, uh, saying we want good relations, Biden was at the same time signing another unilateral executive order to tighten the restrictions on technology exports to China. So we can't so far sustain quiet and calm. But I think the intention right now is with an overloaded US foreign policy, a failing war in Ukraine, a disaster in the Middle East, um, a president that's very unpopular, uh, running against a probable convicted felon. It's a great scene. Um, they want not so much tension in the next 12 months, and I think that that is the goal right now. And since there's no deep reason for this conflict, other than the ones that I've described, it would not be hard to dial back the tensions. It's not as if we are at dire loggerheads over anything real. We are in a constructed confrontation out of mindsets not out of direct clash of interests. So finally, I am late and have to go and am uh, hogging the mic. Uh, China will have its ups and downs, but the main direction is not like that. The main direction is up. Uh, the most basic thing to watch is education, technology, and innovation, and on that, China's in the first ranks. And for an economy at China's level of development, that's the key. And that's not going away. That's going to continue. And China is leader, rightly, in many important technologies for the next 30 years, in uh, digital technologies, uh, in electric vehicles, in renewable energy, in many, many things. And the U.S. might try to, might continue to try to uh, contain China, but it can't do it. Even the technology cutoffs will not have much effect at all. China's busy innovating around 
the microchips, and I would not worry too much about that. And if the U.S. blocks the U.S. market for China's goods, there's a whole world outside of the U.S. that wants Chinese goods, and that's what the Belt and Road Initiative and other similar initiatives in China, like the BRICS uh, expansion, are after. So all in all, China will continue to develop. We should view that absolutely positively. It means better lives for the Chinese people. It means better opportunities for the world economy. It's better for the United States. China's progress is plus for the United States. And we should try to help our politicians make sense. Thank you very much.